morning. Amen. Whew. It's uh, good to worship God together, isn't it? Wait, what, huh? It's good to worship God together, isn't it? Yeah. All right, all right. I was thinking I was the only one worshiping here for a second. Hey, uh, this reminds me, next week, the evening, the 22nd, I want to add my invitation and encouragement to you to, for you to come to our night of worship. And what we just tasted... Worshiping God for who He is as a big body of believers. It's, that's what we're going to do that night. It's going to be awesome. I do want to share with you some exciting things that God is has shown me and shown our team about what we're what God's going to be doing uh, through us and guiding us and leading us through the next couple of years. It's pretty cool. And uh, I would invite you to think over the next week, up until and around that night. Just take some time to think back to what God has done in your life over the last year. Um, how has God blessed you? What has God done? And uh, I don't know, if, do you guys do this around Thanksgiving? This is a good, good thing to do, is just to, to pause, look back, and say, Lord, thank you. I, I remember you did this. I remember you did that. And uh, I also want to encourage you to um, do something that maybe you've never done before. And that is to, to uh, after you've thought about the things that God's done in your life to, to, to praise Him, is to put together a Thanksgiving offering. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but uh, this is something you see happening in the Bible, that people say, you know, I, Lord, I want to thank you. I want to praise you for all your blessings. Now, this is not a payback. Lord, thank you for all you've done. Here, I, you know, I want to I pay you back. You, you, there, there is no amount of money that could pay God back, amen, for what he's done in our life. But it's, the Bible does this, and, and uh, I grew up doing this. And if you've never done this, maybe this is a start of a new tradition. At Thanksgiving, give God a Thanksgiving offering just to say thank you. And I would encourage you this year to bring it to that night of thanksgiving and worship. That, that as an act of thanksgiving, as an act of worship, you bring that offering and say, yes, Lord, thank you. And, um, and if you can't do it that night, you know, bring it that morning, Sunday morning, Thanksgiving morning, I'll be preaching a sermon talking about what God's done in our life over the last year through the power of the word. But, you know, do that. And if you've never done it before, start it as a new thing. And did you get my letter this week? Um, I hope some of you got our letter. Maybe uh, you'll get it this week. Um, Jonathan Abdul, our finance guy, and Jamie Jackson, our, our executive pastor, told me that um, if, if, if each one of us who give, and I hope that's, that's you, would give $180 over what we had planned on giving the rest of the year, that would help us completely get rid of the deficit that we have as we come to the end of the year. And uh, I want to invite you to prayerfully consider that and make that $180 or more that you want to give as a, a thank you to God for what he's done. Cool? Wow. I, I, I don't know what's going on here this morning. Okay, well, I tell you what, you aren't going to be able to be quiet when I'm preaching. So let me, let me pray. And I got some cool things to share. Lord, I'm so pumped about what you've shown me this past week. And as we get ready to open your word today now, God, do in, in us what you did in me this past week. Uh, open our eyes to the amazing truths that you have. And Lord, we will praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so I grew up hearing, maybe you've heard this too, over the years, all different kinds of people comparing Jesus to this or that. You know, it was, Jesus is like, and then, you know, kind of fill in the blank. And so I remember the first thing I ever heard was, Jesus is like a Coke. He's the real thing. And I'm like, that is really cheesy. And then I, I, then I heard, um, you know, Jesus is like a Ford. He has a better idea. And I'm like, can, can, can you have a better idea? That's pitiful. Uh, Jesus is like um, Sprite. He's, a, he's the ultimate thirst quencher. And over the years, I've heard all these. You know, Jesus is like a pumpkin. What? Jesus is like a Snickers bar. Jesus is like a, 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 a computer. And I, over the years, I've heard all these comparisons. And sometimes I'm like, what are you talking about? Where is the comparison between what you're saying Jesus is like and the Jesus I know? But, um, you know, I've never made a big deal out of it until I heard one that was so over the top and so bad. I was like, that is, 
I mean, it's, it's downright blasphemous. It's so offensive. And I, I want to share with you today, and it's so nasty, it's so bad, I can hardly say it, but if I don't say it, then my whole sermon introduction is ruined. So, so here it is. Some, some of you, when I, when I say this, you're going to go, what? You're going to recoil in aversion. And if you're like me, that's what I did. So here we go. Ready? Jesus is like a snake. I know, right? What? How? I mean, I hate snakes. They're, they're slimy. They're nasty. They're deceptive. You know, they're, uh, my wife was telling me this past week when she was a teenager, she went to this camp and Jake or Jack the snake man came and let everybody hold the snake. And my wife let a snake wrap itself around. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I just, I hate snakes. If I see a snake, I want to run over it, kill it, cut its head off. I'm, I just don't do snakes. And clearly, the person who compared Jesus to a snake did not know their Bible because anybody who knows their Bible knows that snakes are bad news in the Bible. I mean, the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, the snake is the is the thing, is the animal, the reptile that deceives Adam and Eve. And then throughout the Bible, snakes are bad. You get to the last book of the Bible, not maps, but Revelation. And the last book of the Bible, you know, that says that the, the great, the ancient serpent, the devil himself. So snakes are not good. Who is comparing Jesus to a snake? Well, when I tell you you might be surprised. And when I discovered who it was, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, I have so much respect for this person that whatever they say, even though it dry, it's like nasty, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into it. I'm going to check it out because I respect this person. You know who it was that said Jesus is like a snake? Jesus himself. And you're like, huh? I know. What? Turn to John chapter 3 and I'll show you this. It's crazy. And as you're turning... Let me, let me help you understand that what I'm about to show you absolutely affects you. This is not just something interesting. What I want to help you see today, it makes a difference between life and death for you. So find John chapter 3. And um, if you were here last week, we started John chapter 3 by looking at the story of Nicodemus. That's what's happening. And I, I, when I was reading last week, I stopped reading and said, okay, we'll pick this up next week. So that's where I want to pick it up. Jesus is having this conversation with this biblical scholar, this Old Testament, uh, this guy who knows the Old Testament inside out. May, he may have the first five books of the Old Testament memorized because a lot of the guys like him in his day did. Uh, and yet he comes to Jesus with questions about the kingdom of God. And, and in the process, Jesus says some wild things like, Nicodemus, you can't even understand the answers that I'm going to give you. You can't even understand the kingdom of God. You can't see the truths of the kingdom of God unless you've been born again. And Nicodemus goes, born again? Is that like the next Jason Bourne movie? What, what's, you guys don't see Jason Bourne movie? Okay. Um, what's born again? I know it's kind of crazy when you first hear it. He says, and he actually said this, do I need to climb inside my mother's womb and be born? Again? That's crazy, Jesus. And Jesus goes, yeah, you don't, you don't get it. You don't see it. This is my point. You don't see it. And then he explains how it's a work of the Holy Spirit. Nicodemus is scratching his head, roping his beard like this is, I don't. And he says in verse 9, how can this be? And that's what I want to pick up today. Verse 9. How can this, explain this to me. What, what are you talking about, Jesus? I respect you, but you're talking crazy talk. And Jesus says, you're Israel's teacher, and you don't understand these things? Jump down to verse 12. Um, I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe when I speak of heavenly things? Listen. No one has ever gone up into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses, just as, there's our comparison language, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And I, I, I read that and I'm like, okay, well, Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe we misunderstood. 
Maybe Jesus is, 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 when he says the son of man, maybe he's not referring to himself. Maybe he's referring to some other son of man. Only problem with that is that every time Jesus uses the phrase, without question, every time he uses the phrase son of man, he's referring to himself. And over 75 times he does this. It's his favorite way to refer to himself. You can read it in the Gospels. So clearly, there's no misunderstanding. Jesus is talking about himself. I am like you know, a snake that was the one that was lifted up in the wilderness. And you read a little closer, you're like, well, maybe, maybe Jesus is comparing himself to Moses. That would be good. Moses and Jesus, there's a comparison there. No, no, read verse 14. You can't miss this. The snake was lifted up. And Jesus says, I will be lifted up. There's no mistaking this. The Son of Man is Jesus. He's comparing himself to, you know, the snake and saying just like it was lifted up. Okay, so Jesus, what are you talking about? Well, I guess and we can't really understand what this is happening until what's happening in this text until we put to, to bed the idea that Jesus is comparing himself to a snake. And we look at these words, sometimes an article makes a difference, to the snake. See this. Jesus is saying, I'm not like any other snake, or I'm not like snakes in general. I am comparing myself to that particular snake, the snake, the one that is in the story of Moses in the wilderness. So do you know the story he's talking about? Um, Nicodemus did. J Jesus couldn't have picked a a place of scripture to go to that Nicodemus knew any better than the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. As I said, a lot of the Pharisees uh, in Jesus' day had the first five books memorized. So Jesus is referring to a story in Numbers chapter 21. So if you'll open your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Numbers, uh, we'll look at the story that Nicodemus knew really well, but maybe you don't know as well. And I didn't have you stand up to read John because I didn't want to do the up and down thing. So would you please stand and we'll read from the fourth book of the Old Testament, chapter 21, looking at verse 4. They, who's they? That's the nation of Israel. They're all together. There's, you know... Hundreds and thousands, maybe a couple million of them who are coming from Egypt. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the, dead, to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way and they spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why? Why have you brought us out of Egypt just to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, there's no water, and, we're, and we detest this miserable food, the, the heavenly food that God was feeding them. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, and they bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses, and watch what they said. We sinned. Don't miss that. We sinned when we spoke against the Lord, and we sinned when we spoke against you, Moses, God's leader. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses did exactly that. He made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake, they looked and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Okay, you may be seated. I, st I still find myself saying, Jesus, out of all the stories in the Old Testament that you could have used to, dis to, to explain Nicodemus' question, to explain what you mean by, by being born again, to explain what's happening in our lives when we're born again, of all the stories you could have used in the Old Testament, why this one? Dude, why? I did call him, dude. Jesus, why snakes? No, no, again, that story in the Old Testament, Jesus stomped on the head of the snake. Ugh, I just, I, I hate snakes, but it's, it's Jesus. He's telling the story. He has a purpose. I want to know what the purpose is. Do you? Please say yes. yes. Thank you. I, otherwise, I have nothing else to say. 
there's a couple powerful truths that I want you to see, and I think that Jesus wanted Nicodemus to see. Even, even though Nicodemus uh, more than likely didn't get <laughs> at least 50%, even maybe 90% of what Jesus was saying, there was a day coming when Nicodemus would look back and go, oh, my God. I love it when I can actually say that. Oh, my God, that, that, that's, that's Jesus. That's, that's what he was talking about. What, what, what am I talking about? Well, in this passage, the Israelites have been delivered from Egypt. Moses is leading them into the promised land, Canaan. They want to go through Edom. The Edomites won't let them through, so they have to go around. And they're mad about it. They start grumbling. They, they, it says they, they spoke against God and against Moses, and they said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die? They're mad they're angry, they're impatient, they're speaking against Moses, and, and all these, these bad things are happening, and it says the Lord sent venomous snake, venomous snakes to, to bite them, and a lot of people died. We don't know how many, but there's a ton of Israelites that died in the desert at the, at the, hand, of these, at the hand of these snakes. Snakes don't have hands. At the mouth of these snakes, and... Um, notice, as I pointed out when I read it, the people say, we, we, we get it, we've sinned. I, I paused when I read that, and I made a big deal out of it because I want you to see how Jesus is using this story to help teach, teach Nicodemus, who thinks he doesn't sin, and to help teach any of us who think that sin is no big deal. He's using this story to help us see that sin is a really big deal. It's a lot bigger deal than most of us think. And sometimes we're like, why is the preacher railing about, why is God so mad about sin? What's the big deal? I mean, why are people dying because of sin? Here's, here's why. Because God loves you and he knows sin destroys you. It destroys your marriages. It destroys your mind. It destroys your heart. It destroys everything about you. It destroys society. Our society right now is falling apart. I mean, what's happening in Paris? Our, our world is falling apart. It's imploding because of what? Sin. Sin destroys. And God, who loves people like crazy, therefore hates Anything that destroys the people he made, that's everybody. God's against sin, not because I'm just against something. It's because it destroys the, the people who are made in his image, and it destroys their marriages and their families. And, and the ripple effect is just, it's beyond description. And only God grasps how vile, how horrible how terrible sin is, and that's why God judges sin. You, you can write down in your notes that our sin brings upon us the curse of death. Sin is, is, is a big deal, friends. Your sin... My sin has earned us, what does Paul say? For the wages of sin, some of you know this verse. What is a wage? It's something I've earned because of what I've done. The wages of sin is death. Our sin brings upon us the curse of death. Thank God there's a, the word but is in there. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul realized how powerful sin was. God gave him an insight to, to write the, New, Test, the New, New Testament books to help people see. Sin is not a small thing. It's not a little thing. You, it, it's, it's a big deal because it brings death. So maybe you know this. The whole world is under the curse of death. The whole world is under the curse of death, and it's nobody's fault but our own. It's our sin. And Nicodemus doesn't get this yet back in John chapter 3, but Jesus is telling this connection and making this connection so that Moses 
story of the snake in the wilderness would, would uh, just be indelibly imprinted upon Nicodemus' mind so that he would never forget. And notice that this, this story of this sin gives us a couple of good illustrations of some of the sin that is, is even around today. So here's a couple pictures from sin. Look, look at verse, uh, see here, verse 5 says, or actually verse 4, the, the people grew impatient on the way. Is impatience a sin? Is impatience a sin? I know some of you are expecting me to say yes. I, I actually don't think it is, necessarily. Impatience is what happens within human beings, um, you know, when things go wrong. But impatience can become a sin when I don't handle it right. In the same way, anger it's not necessarily sin, but it can become sin. And in this case, the impatience absolutely led to sin. What's the sin? Very next verse, verse 5. They spoke against God and against Moses. The key word here is the word against. Come on, come on. The word against. I mean, we we kind of look at the word grumbling. Oh, you're not supposed to grumble. But the key word is the word against. God's not saying if you get up on the wrong side of bed and you have a, a rough morning and you grumble, you know, that's sin. You, it might be. I don't know. It depends on what you say when you're grumbling. But the issue here is that they're grumbling against God. What's that? Speaking against God, grumbling against him, blaming God. God, you're not fair. God, um, you've let me down. God, why won't you take care of me? That's blasphemy, slandering the character of God. That's, when you grumble against God, that's what you're doing. You're slandering his character. Because God's good. He's perfect. He's gracious. He's loving. He's been that way in your life. But when you trash him, when you grumble against him, you're blaspheming his name. You're slandering God and his character. It's a big deal. That's the first sin in this story. And this sin gets you know, worse but before it gets worse, let me help you see where this grumbling comes from. Over and over again in the Old Testament, you see this word unbelief. We read it this past week in Hebrews chapter 3, if you were reading the church devotions. And um, the writer of the Hebrews was quoting Psalm 95. It says, today is the day of salvation. You know, today if you hear God's word, if you hear the things that God has said, don't harden your heart. And, uh, and go into rebellion because of, the, of unbelief. And what God was saying is that is because of the Israelites' unbelief, they died in the wilderness. Because of their unbelief, God brought punishment to them, upon them. Again, is unbelief that big of a deal? Yes, it is. Now, unbelief can be a little bit of a misnomer because you might look at them and go, well, that person doesn't believe. But the truth is, everybody believes. When the Bible says unbelief, it's not saying you don't believe. It's saying you don't believe in God. Because everybody believes. Everybody. What do most people believe? Who do most people believe in? Them, yes, themselves. So everybody believes. Everybody has faith. But the Bible says that God made you. You belong to him. He wants you to believe in him and put your faith in him to trust him and to demonstrate that trust by the way you live, by the way you spend your money, by the way you spend your time, by the, way, by the words that come out of your mouth, by the things that you pursue. You know, and the Israelites were demonstrating over and over again, they didn't believe in God. That's why they grumbled. See, unbelief is always the root to our sin. It's the root that leads to complaining and accusing God and grumbling and, and all the, the other kinds of sin that, that yield itself. Unbelief is a big deal. That's why God goes after it again and again. And in this case, the unbelief, I don't trust what God's doing here. I'm sick of the food. I'm sick of the desert. I don't believe that God has my best interest in mind. So I'm going to grumble against him, slander his name, blaspheme, and I'm going to start a rebellion. This is what kept happening over and over in the Old Testament, is the rebellion started in this person or that person, and they started to grumble and complain to another person. Have you ever noticed how grumbling and complaining and unbelief is contagious? You ever noticed that? On a team, in a workplace, in a family, at school... Grumbling, complaining is contagious, and, and it leads in this case, and many times in the Old Testament, to rebelliousness. So they're planning this coup. 
Um, th- this is actually the 10th time that we, the, the writer points out to us that the people grumbled and, and started saying, you know, Moses, they're speaking against him. We're, we, we don't want you as our leader. We, don't, we want to go back to Egypt. We're taking over here. And, and so God, who's got dreams for his promised people, he's got dreams for you. God's got a dream for you. And when your rebellion takes you down a path that will derail you from God's purpose for your life, God in love will chastise you. He will punish you. He will discipline you so that you don't wreck, sabotage his dreams, his plans for your life. So many times we're so you know, upset with God, so mad that he's disciplining us. Why are you being bit rough on me, God? He's doing that because he loves you like a father who loves his children. So God disciplines those that he loves. So fathers and, and mothers, let me talk to you a little bit, a bit about discipline. Uh, I, I told my kids and I've told many other parents over the years, I want you to be real clear about when you get spanked in this family. And you should never spank a a child because they just uh, made a mistake or because they lied or or because they they did something wrong. Only spank your children when you sense defiant rebellion, when they're lying because they're rebellious and because they're defiant. Don't spank them for any other reason. It's just not necessary. Kids make mistakes. They, they screw up. They, they lied because they were afraid. You, you're going to spank your child because they're afraid? No, no, no. Don't do that. But don't go to the other extreme and go, well, that defiance, that rebellion, it's no big deal. Learn a lesson from God the Father. Those of you with long, young kids, when you see defiance, when you see rebellion rising up in your children, Deal with that. Deal with it. Because that rebellion, if left unchecked, will destroy them. Here's the question. Do you love your kids enough to discipline them? Or are you such a wuss as a parent that you were like, you see rebellion and you're like, well, you know, that just happens. No, it's hard, but deal with that. kind. That's what God does. It's, it's, it's hard being a parent. And God, the perfect parent, says, I see rebellion coming up. I see defiance. I've got to deal with that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring a punishment. I'm, I'm going to send the snakes to send a message to discipline so people realize it. And, I, and they did. You know, verse, what is it? Uh, verse Verse 7. The people came to Moses and said, we get it. We sinned when we spoke against you, when we spoke against the Lord. (laughs) Okay, we own it. Please get rid of these snakes. It's bad news. And and notice what um, happens next. Verse 8, the Lord said to Moses. So there's this thing happening here where God is going to step in. I highlighted the words the Lord said because I want you to see that God's about to do something here. God's going to initiate something with Moses and with the people to bring them out of the rebellion, to heal them, to forgive them, to bring them back into relationship. And it has to do with this snake up on a pole that anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. What's, what's happening there? God in his grace provides the cure for the curse. Do you see that? God's the one who gave this idea to Moses and said, the curse of death that comes upon you. See, the snakes were a picture. The snakes were a picture of sin. They're a picture of the power of sin. They're a picture of the consequences of sin. They're a picture of the curse that, that comes, the, the death. See, God never intended for humans to die. God's, God, if there had never been sin, we would just kind of slip into eternity. Death is the enemy. And it was ushered into our world as the curse of sin. We're all under the curse, but God wants to break the curse. So he initiates in his grace. Don't miss this. 
God starts as, what's, what does he start? Well, the, the passage, my clicker's not working. The passage says that to make a snake. I've highlighted the word make and made because I want to make a real clear point here. God did not say to Moses, take a snake, you know, grab one of those dead snakes or one of those live ones, you know, and stick it up on a pole. The reason why he says make a snake is because he said, I want this snake that you make, that you fashion, this replica of a snake, I want it to represent the sin. I want it to represent the, the curse. This is going to be something that's going to represent all the, the, the damage, all the death, all the sin, all the, all the hurt, all the, all the pain. That's what's going to be up there on that pole. And it's going to be made by you, Moses, to represent all the damage, all the sin, all the, all the death. Now watch the screen. Notice the words make and see what Paul does in 2 Corinthians when he says, God, everybody say these words. Who's him? Well, the one who had no sin. That's Jesus. Same words. God made Jesus. Now, he's not talking about God creating. Jesus is already alive. He's on, he's on planet Earth. He's lived a perfect life for 30 years. But, but there's a moment in Jesus' life where God fashioned him, where God made him, God put upon him all the sin in the world. He made him who had no sin to be Sin, just like that bronze serpent, became the picture of sin, became the picture of the curse, became the picture of death and the consequences of sin. This is exactly what God has done in Christ. He said, that perfect son of God, that my child, my, not my child, my, my, my son, my, um, the second person of the Trinity, the perfect one, he's going to become sin so that we sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. This is Wild, what's God doing? God knows that the, the, the punishment for your sin is your death. Don't let death become abstract. It's your death, but not just your physical death. Your punishment for your rebellion against God is eternal death. Let that sink in. You can't save yourself. There's nothing you can do. Just like in the story in Numbers 21. These people couldn't save themselves, heal themselves. They know they're screwed. And so they say, Moses, do something. Pray for us. We've sinned. We get it. We messed up. We've rebelled against God. Save us. We don't all want to die here. So God, who knows that we can't save ourselves, he says, I'm going to take the perfect Lamb of God, the perfect Son of God, and I'm going to put on Him. Isaiah 53 says, that the Lord laid on Him the iniquity of us all. What's iniquity? Sin. Your sin. My sin. My thoughts, my words, my deeds that were sin, that are sin. God laid all that sin upon Jesus. He became sin. But not just sin. He took upon the curse of sin. He He took upon the the, the curse that came. And so when he was lifted up, again, I want you guys to see how these go together. The snake is lifted up. Jesus is lifted up. Jesus is drawing a, a parallel here that is unmistakable. That that snake made to be sin, the consequence of sin, a picture of the power of sin that brought the curse. That snake actually represents me, Jesus said, that snake, not any snake, it represents me. The day is going to come. Nicodemus, I know this is crazy to you, but I'm going to be lifted up. Now, lifted up is a reference to the cross. Um, it's a reference to the, the wooden pole. That's, whether it's a pole, a cross beam, or whether it's a cross you know, or a, a tree, it's, it's being lifted up, up on that tree. It's being lifted up. This is a picture of the cross. And Nicodemus can't fathom what Jesus is talking about, but you can connect the dots and see what Jesus is doing here and and realize how God is judging sin, how God is helping us see how big of a deal sin is and how God has made a plan back in John. He's made a plan to deal with this sin so that we don't die in our sins. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross, and I love this word, 
to rescue us from certain eternal death. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot save each other. Only Jesus can rescue us. And how does he do that? He rescues us from the curse. Notice what, J what Paul says in J Galatians chapter 3 when he says that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse. Becoming the curse for us. And then he quotes this Old Testament passage. For everyone who is hung upon a pole, a tree, is cursed. Now, this is a very significant verse, and this is why Jews now, you know, Israelites then, could not see Jesus as Messiah. Because Messiahs kick butt. Messiahs don't die. Messiahs rule. They kick the Romans out. They con Messiahs are kings. They don't die. Messiahs can't be cursed. They're anointed of God. See this. There can't be a connection between somebody being cursed by God and being anointed by God. Messiahs can't be cursed. Or so the Jewish mind thinks. So, so the mind steeped in the Old Testament thinks. This is the revelation that Jesus brought, the revelation that Paul wrought, but that God actually made him who knew no sin to be sin, to take upon the curse for us so we don't have to die eternally. And that curse of death fell upon Jesus on the cross when he took all of the sin of the world. You know the story of Jesus dying on the cross. Do you know he became cursed for you? Do you know he became the curse of death? He absorbed all the sin of the world. He absorbed all, all the power of the curse of death upon himself. And he, he absorbed it and dissolved it and broke its power. That's what happened when Jesus became cursed for you. It was God's plan that the Lamb of God would take away the sin of the world by taking upon the curse of the world, by, by shedding his blood. It was God's plan that the anointed would become the cursed so you could be set free. Can I hear a hallelujah? That's God's plan. I know it's crazy. You and I would have never come up with it. How can anointing and cursing go together? Only in God's perfect wisdom does that play out. But that is what God was doing in Christ when he was reconciling the world to himself. That's what the, the picture of the, the cross is. The God of the universe becomes man, lives a perfect, sinless life, and takes upon your curse, your death. It was my death he died. He paid the penalty for my sin. Do you see this? I plead with you, don't let distractions let you miss this connection. This is the difference between life and death. If you don't see, if you think of Jesus as just some nice story, yeah, yeah, he died on the cross, you don't see the connection, you're, you're lost. You're damned by your own sin and rebellion and blindness to the truth of God. I'm pleading with you. God, open our eyes to see the significance of this story. Let us never again trivialize sin. Our grumbling, our speaking against God, our slander of his character. Oh, it's no big deal. Jesus died for me. Oh my gosh, how can you even think that? So what's... You know, did Jesus die for the whole world? Is everybody automatically saved? How does it work? How, how, do I, how do I take what he's done for me 
Is it automatic? Oh, no. There's one more powerful truth in, in Numbers 21 that I want you to see. And, and I'll put this on the screen for you when my clicker will work. So Moses, Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake, they looked. That's not a glance. They looked at the bronze snake and they lived. What's happening here? That look is a look of connection. It's a look of faith. I'm connecting that, that symbol of, of death, that symbol of curse is, is something that God ordained so that when I would look to it, by faith I would realize that my, my sin, my grumbling and speaking against God has forgiven me and I will not die. I will live. It's a look of faith. It's a look of belief. And so Jesus says in John chapter 3, he says, So just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes, that's everyone who looks in faith. So see, Jesus took upon all the sin of the world. He was the cursed one. And when we look at what he did on the cross and say, I get it. I believe you died for me. That look of faith and connecting is the, is the moment that the Holy Spirit opens your eyes and you go, I realize he died for me. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for dying for me. I realize you died in my place. Thank you for your forgiveness. I receive your forgiveness. That's the connection. That's the faith. So our job is to look in faith at Christ and his death on the cross. When we do that, that's when salvation comes. You don't get saved by going to church. You don't get saved by giving money. You don't get saved by coming down to an altar and praying some tears. You get saved by confessing your sin, realizing that you've been in rebellion, and you look to Jesus Christ as the one who died on the cross for your sin, and you connect that, and you realize that cross is your way to redemption, your way to salvation. If you look to Christ on the cross, I believe you died for me. That faith engages what Jesus did. The Holy Spirit sees your faith and he connects Christ's death. He does this in the, in the invisible places of our heart and soul. He connects Christ's death as you engage with faith. The Holy Spirit connects Christ's death with your belief, your faith, and bam, you're born again. The Holy Spirit sees that faith, not just because of words, it's because of the faith that you engage. And if you don't believe, if you think it's just a fairy tale, then there is no bam. There is no salvation. You start the process of, as we said last week, of being saved as you agree with God that you're in rebellion, that you're a sinner. But you are saved in a moment when your faith engages what God did on the cross. The Holy Spirit does that. Now watch this. That gets preached, you said amen, but you realize that Jesus didn't just die for your salvation. What? Oh no, it's so much bigger than that. I'm so glad he died on the cross to save me from my sins. But friends, it's much bigger than that. Jesus didn't just die for our salvation. The cross is also for our transformation. How do I know that? Because the whole story here is Jesus is answering the question of Nicodemus, how can this be? How can what be? How can new birth happen? How can transformation where I am born again, how can this happen? It happens when we look by faith to what Christ did on the cross and connect that. And now I'm not just saved, hallelujah, I'm on the process of being transformed to becoming more and more like Christ. I'm beginning the process of sanctification, becoming holy. I'm being transformed. We got people all over churches who think because they sit in church, have shed a tear, have said some words that they're Christian, but there is no evidence in their life. Friends, if there's not transformation happening in your life, you might not be saved. Why? Because Jesus didn't die just to save your sorry soul in heaven as a person who continues to sin against him. Jesus saved you so you would be changed and get ready for heaven. Jesus died on the cross for your transformation. So you say, well, what does that mean? Well, let's go back to the beginning of the story in Numbers 21. Let's see some of the sins that are happening here, and it'll help us see what we're transformed from. We're transformed from grumbling against God. You're not a good God. You won't take care of me. I can't trust you. I don't, I, to grateful. 
Lord, I, I don't understand all that you're doing, but I trust you and I love you. It's, it transforms the, the unbelief to trusting. See, trust is not sight. Trust happens when I can't see what God's doing. Trust is when everything is going off in alarms in my I'm like, oh, look, God's not taking care of me. He's going to let me die. He's going to let me fall. He, I, it's not going to work. I better, I better seize control here because God's not going to. That's unbelief. And instead, when you're born again, you are transformed to begin to trust God and to be grateful even in the difficult times. Is this transformation happening in your life? Or are you one of these Christians who's still grumbling, angry, rebellious, stingy, mean? <laughs> there's been no birth happening in your life. And if there's no transformation that's begun, you're probably going to hell. You're like, how dare you say that? I say it on the authority of God's word. Jesus doesn't save us so we can continue to sin and live in rebellion. He saves us so we can be changed from the inside out. Now, you're, are you saying that once I'm saved, I shouldn't sin? Well, actually, I'm saying you shouldn't, but you will. I do. Here's the difference. There should be no rebellion in your life. Click. Heart check here. The transformation of the new birth, the Holy Spirit causing you to be born again, should root out all defiance and rebellion against God. And if there's still rebellion against God, that's a pretty good sign. Your heart has not been changed. You will still sin, fail. You still will have, not have the faith you need. We all do this. We're frail. We sin. But there should not be rebellion. This idea that I can be saved and live in rebellion against God is not a biblical idea. I know this is harsh truth, but rebellion does not belong in the heart of a saved, sanctified disciple of Jesus Christ. We are transformed from lost sinners to growing disciples. Let me leave you with this haunting, invasive question. Do you see transformation in your life? I'm not asking if you're perfect. Nobody is. We are, even if you're a very mature Christian, you are far from perfect. Please hear me. I'm not saying you should be perfect or anywhere near perfect. I'm saying if your heart's been changed, if there's been transformation, if you've been born again, there should be new desires, a new heart, a new passion, new direction. There should not be rebellion. So if you see rebellion in your heart, do the heart check. Ask God, what is up with that? Do you see evidence in your life of being transformed by the cross? How has the cross transformed your life? Would you please close your eyes with me? God, with that question hanging in the air, we invite your Holy Spirit to search our hearts, to see if there's any wicked way in us, and to lead us in the way everlasting, to, to point out sin, but specifically, God, I'm asking you today, would you expose rebellion in our hearts? And may we shudder. May we, may we cringe at the thought that there is rebellion against the King of Heaven in our hearts. And may we confess it. 
God, for, for whatever reason, if, if, if there's, for whatever reason that we're living in rebellion, it, that's really not the point. The point is that we are living in rebellion. Deal with us. As a loving father, God, look upon us and discipline us. See in us redemptive potential. I, I, I shouldn't even pray that. I know that you see. This is, this is what you do. I don't have to ask you. This, you are the only one who sees in us redemptive potential. God, in all of our sin and all of our rebellion and all of our defiance and all of our mistakes and all of our failures and all of our faithlessness, you see it all. And yet, you see deeper than that the image of God that you planted in us. And you see, this is the one for whom I sent my son to die. I don't want them to live in rebellion. I don't want them to be doing their own thing. I want to save them. Lord, do whatever it takes to save us. to take us out of the slavery, out of the Egyptian slavery that we wallow in and bring us into the promised land. Your grace, your life, and your abundance. Bring us to the cross where Jesus, you dealt with sin and sins, where you dealt by taking upon yourself the curse of death. You dealt with the power of sin once and for all, and you broke its power so we could be redeemed, saved, set free, and so we could live in the promised land of your abundance. Let's all stand to our feet, all of our venues. And our worship teams are going to sing a song about a place where each one of us can go for the first time or for the thousandth time. Lord, bring us to the cross. We bow before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.